So I hope you enjoyed your weekend. So this week we're back to our regular schedule of two lectures, both on Monday and then on Wednesday. And so today is the seventh lecture of, of the course and we're gonna be covering the representability of the diagonal. And uh, so I have, I, I put up the three definitions, the three main definitions of really of the entire course up here to remind you of how we're defining algebraic spaces, Dillian Mumford stacks and algebraic stacks. I mean, they're essentially just like say an algebraic space is just, uh, is a sheaf in a big tau topology such that a tau locally, it's a scheme. So it's a subjective tau morphism representable by schemes. And then a Dillian Mumford stack is then a stack in the big tau topology that's a tau locally a scheme. And an algebraic stack is then smooth locally a scheme. Uh, these definitions are different than, than the ones that you usually see in the literature, usually there's a condition that the, di that the diagonal is representable, sometimes with additional hypothesis. And sort of today, we're going to make the, connect, the connection and, and establish that, you know, just with, with these properties, we get that the diagonal is representable. And um, sort of like, so one of, the, I guess, one of the advantages of giving the definitions this way is that, um, well, it's, it's just that they have less conditions, it's succincter. And, and for some general constructions, it's therefore easier to verify some things in algebraic stack or algebraic space, such as quotient stacks or even, yeah, like even, yeah, the quotient stack of a group action or even of an equivalence relation, the proof is a little bit easier. In practice, when you want to verify certain moduli problems are algebraic, it's sometimes actually useful to first show that the diagonal is representable. Because as we'll see later, this, ins this ensures that any morphism from a scheme to, to your stack is, is, is representable. So therefore that, that helps in verifying sort of this condition of the cover. Uh, all right, but maybe before I get started, I, I'll, um, yeah, my, my plan, yeah, so the plan today is to cover representability of the diagonal and then maybe get to some of the material on properties of stacks. We want to Define dimension, tangent space, and residual gerbs, uh, so that we might delay that some of that to, to Wednesday. And I'm going to begin with a review of equivalence relations and groupoids, um, and uh, complete one missing detail from last lecture. But maybe before I begin formally, let me take pause for questions. Okay, so the, one of the key definitions we had last time um, where the notion was the notion of a tau groupoids and a tau equivalence relation. So I, I'm just gonna remind you of the definition here, but not spend too much time on it. Basically the data is you have uh, um, two morphisms of schemes, um, S and T, thinking of, of a, as the source and the target. And you think of R as a scheme R as sort of a set of a scheme of relations of, of you, of telling you which points in you you want to identify. Uh, and so two points should be identified if there's an element of R such that the source is one and the target is the other. And then just like how you impose, you know, like natural conditions for a, like a set theoretic equivalence relation, we have sort of these natural properties that, um, that we, that, we, yeah, that that uh, ensures that it's yeah that is well behaved, and and I wanted to remind you that that uh, in the special case that if you look in the bottom here in the special case that there's only a unique relation between any two um, elements of U. Uh, in other words, that this map is a monomorphism, then we call uh, then we call it an Natal equivalence relation, and. Maybe we have, maybe just note that we have the same definition for uh, smooth. Just replacing the word a tau with smooth, we get the notion of smooth groupoids and smooth equivalence relations. And the main example of this construction comes from equivariant geometry, where you take an algebraic group G acting on a scheme U. And then your set of relations R is G cross 
you and your two maps are is one the group action and two the second project projection. Right, that's where we were, and then we have. Uh, so and then we defined last time the quotient stack. U mod R of a let's say of a of a smooth groupoid R to U of schemes uh, is by definition the stackification of the pre stack U mod R pre, where the fiber category. over scheme S is, is the groupoid qu quotient of the corresponding, is the, yeah, is the stack, is, yeah, is of the corresponding uh, relation. So U of S, R of S. So maybe point out, this is the groupoid quotient of the, of the set theoretic groupoid. And one other thing we did last time was we we uh, we know that there's nice some nice Cartesian diagrams associated to this construction, namely that uh, that if you take the, the, well first there's this, this projection map, which just exists essentially by definition, um, and and if you take the fiber product of it over itself, you get R, with this map being S and T. So these are, this is Cartesian. And then the other relation is uh, the other diagram is you take the fiber product of the diagonal with two copies of the projection and you also get the scheme of relations. Hey, uh, Jared. Yeah. You know, um, this is this stackification procedure is fine in a tall topology if you know, I mean, that um, S and T are either smooth or a tall, right? Mm -hmm. So don't don't do this when it's more general, right? Because then you don't get the right thing, I think. Y right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the right uh, thing, whatever that means, right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, I, yeah. So I, right, something I. Yeah, I think Johan's point is that if you wanted to, to generalize this uh, to sort of like maybe to F, to, to, to flat morphism, say to maybe an FPPF groupoid, uh, you can still take the quotient stack, but this isn't the right definition. Um, part, yeah. Uh, Actually, Jared, can you, uh, well, maybe I'll ask to say more about that, but also, Maybe related, I was going to say that when you said you know these things, you mean these are like exercises you have to, that people should prove rather than. Yeah, yeah. Last time I listed them as exercises. Okay. Yeah. And I think okay. they're really important exercises. Like uh, that gives you a, a handle on, 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 you know, working with fiber products of, of stacks. Um, and you get, and, and when you do those exercises, you get into some of the, the subtle properties of fiber products. Okay, so, so what I wanted to uh, to show was that the quotient stack is, is algebraic. So here's here's the theorem. Sorry, can I ask you something? Sure. So uh, in the previous page, you uh, so with the notation of the group point quotient of uh, so R S is a group. Uh, RS, no, RS is a, is a set. Yeah, exactly. So the notation, we define that only for an action of a group on a set, right? That's true. Yes, I think you're exposing. Yeah, I should have, you're right. I, I should have, yeah, I should have defined that uh, 
more generally in this context. You're right. I technically did not find the groupoid quotient of a set theoretic groupoid relation, but it, it, it's it's yeah. Um, but you, I mean, you, you just take uh, you take the category where uh, where your objects are just points or are, are just uh, elements of the set, and then your morphisms are defined by R of S. Right, I didn't spell that out before, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so moving on, I, I do want to try to show this, yeah, this theorem that, uh, that this quotient stack, that when you form the, if, if you either have an Atal or a smooth rubroid, then the quotient stack is either Deline Mumford or an algebraic stack. And so we need to prove, we need to show, we need to, to show that the, natural projection onto U mod R is representable. And to do this, we need to show that we just, um, we take it, we let, let, let's let uh, T to U over G, to U over R be a map from a scheme. And what we need to, to show is that when we compute this fiber product. Let's define. Let's call it U T. Uh, we need to show that that U T is an algebraic space. Uh, and uh, and that U T to T is a tau and surjective or respectively smooth. Okay. But what we, what we know is that essentially by the definition of U mod R as the stackification, we know that there, that, uh, that I can't necessarily lift T, lift the map from T to the quotient. I can't necessarily lift that to U, but I can after uh, an Atal cover. So there exists an Atal cover and a map like this and a commutative, two commutative diagram. And so then we just, we just try to, and then we consider uh, the following diagram. And this, this sort of argument can be used a couple times today. So on one hand, we have from the previous page, the exercise that we have this Cartesian diagram. And, I bit, and then I have T prime here. So I have a, this following cube and uh, everything is Cartesian except the left and right. All right. And then now in this, remember in this diagram, we're really interested in showing that UT is an algebraic space, but at the moment we just know it's, it's, it's a sheaf. But on the other hand, T is a scheme, T prime is a scheme. And, uh, and so is UT prime because it's the base change of the map RU, which was, and that's a morphism of schemes. Uh, and moreover, you know, since T prime to T is, is a morphism of schemes, it's representable by schemes. And that implies that this, this one, uh, I, yeah, let me write it this way. Therefore, uh, UT prime to UT is also a tau, it's also a tau and representable by schemes. Um, and also surjective. 
and that's yeah, and and, and therefore, uh, and and since since this is a scheme, th th that implies that ut is an algebraic space because we found in the tau cover. Yeah, really haven't done much. This, that, yeah, this is an advantage of our def of our definition that there really wasn't much to check, um, and maybe. I should make a, a point that you can try to repeat this argument. Um, well, a similar argument would show that if you take, it would show that if R to U is an Atal equivalence relation, and you assume that both of these maps are um, quasi compact and separated, then that the same argument would show that the quotient u mod r is an algebraic space. This is that this is more challenging to show because we need to show that your cover is not just representable but representable by schemes. And if you have these assumptions that s and t are, are quasi compact and separated, that implies by like by Zariski main theorem that these maps here are quasi-affine. And then we can then we can use essentially effective descent for quasi-affine morphisms because we're trying to show that UT is a sheaf. Uh, and a tau locally, we have a, a scheme that's quasi-affine over T prime. And that means we can descend that to show that UT is quasi-affine over T. But this argument doesn't quite work with well, yeah, without those hypotheses and without using that, it's quasi affine. But we'll return to this and give a different argument in a moment. Okay. Uh, but before going on to the representability of the diagonal, I want to kind of cover a number of examples. And so I'm going to start with an example I've already stated, which is the bug eyed cover, but I'm going to go into maybe more detail. Have a question? Sure. The theorem from before for algebraic spaces also true if without the hypotheses? Yes, it's, with, it's true without the hypothesis. Uh, and we'll show that later today. Yeah. But we're going to use, we're going to use the, yeah, we're going to use the diagonal instead. And we'll first show that the diagonal is representable and then use, yeah, and then use that to, to get a cover. Okay. So, okay, I'm going to give three descriptions of what Kolar calls the bug eye cover. Uh, and we've seen it before, I just haven't used that terminology. So the first, the first one is I'm going to take the action of Z mod two on the non-separated affine line. A1 union A1 over A1 minus the origin, right? And the, the Z2 action uh, is, so this, yeah, this is a picture. So the Z2 action is gonna act freely and by, by, swapping, um, by swapping the origins and by uh, the involution X goes to minus X. And then we form the quotient X is, is the quotient then, um, if, this, if I call this U, then it's gonna be Z, U mod Z mod two. We already, yeah, we saw this as, as, as an example of an algebraic space that wasn't a scheme. Um, but I'm gonna give an equivalent de description right now uh, where I, I'm gonna just take, I'm gonna take the Z two action on A one as above where X goes to minus X under the unique non-identity element. And then I, I consider I consider the smooth, even the tau groupoid, given taken by the group action, but uh, this is not an equivalence relation because there's the origin is fixed by minus one, and so I'm just going to remove that point. So I let R be the complement of uh, of of minus one and zero. This is the unique. This is sort of the unique uh, stabilizer element, non-trivial stabilizer. 
And, and therefore, if I do that, you know, I still have these projections and now it's an equivalence relation. Even a tau equivalence relation. And I could take X to be the quotient of A1 mod R. And the claim is that these two are, are the same. Uh, and yeah, so we have this description, then this description. Um, and for a moment, I mean, oh, okay. Uh, so I guess I've just, I've just used this theorem that you can take quotients by the tau equivalence relations. I haven't quite, quite proved that yet. But so for part of this discussion, yeah, we're gonna use, use some facts that, yeah, cause I just wanna provide yeah, a bunch of examples rather than let's not worry about yeah, what, what we've proven yet or not. <laughs> and actually, and so below here, I took this picture. This is actually a picture from Artin, Artin's paper in the late 70s, I think 78, where he, where he constructs this bug-eyed bug cover. And so here, uh, let me try to explain what's going on. So this is A1, and this, this S here is also A1. And this middle one is the picture of, of this algebraic space. And this composition here is, the, is just the, the double cover of A1 that sends X to X squared. And, um, and so you, what you get here is this weird algebraic space that sort of has, it looks exactly like A1 like the, the map from X to this projection map here from X to A1 is, you know, it's, it's, it's birational. So it's an isomorphism away from the origin. It's also bijective, but there's, but it's sort of a, a funny origin. I guess th this is supposed to be the, the origin over a zero. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a smooth algebraic, one dimensional algebraic space but that the projection map onto A1 you know, is a bijection, it's birational, but it's, 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 uh, it's ramified over the origin. It collapses that tangent vector. So it's sort of a weird, a weird example, but it's also sort of the, easy example, the easiest example to see that it's not an algebraic space. Uh, sorry, that, that is not a scheme. So uh, this, I'm just gonna quickly remind you that this X is not a scheme uh, because if I take I take x I take the diagonal and what we know is that we have this Cartesian diagram and so if I consider a further fiber product where this map sends z let's go z to minus z you realize what this fiber product is is well, there's uh, this minus one Z for Z non-zero and this disjoint union, the unique element over zero. So like when, if you take Z minus Z, there's uh, yeah, there's a unique uh, yeah, relation taking one to the other, but we remove that one over the origin and there we have the identity element. So what this map looks like, it's, it's, it just looks like a disjoint union of two points, of, 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 sorry, of the complement of, of the origin, disjoint union that point projecting back out to here. And so this, it's a monomorphism, but it's not locally closed. And that implies that this thing, this map is not locally closed. So it can't be a scheme. All right. Uh, but, but maybe you think these, these, this is sort of pathological because on one hand, I was taking a group action on a non-separated thing. Here, I'm, I'm cooking up a funky equivalence relation by throwing out the origin. To convince you that this, these, these examples actually show up in nature, there's uh, Mumford, Mumford, in, in Mumford's GIT, he gives an alternative description of this um, where, where you have an action of SL2 uh, so it's going to be, it's, it's also going to be the quotient of a free action of SL2 on something quasi affine. So it's sort of a, a pretty nice situation, but yet you still have this pathological behavior. Let's take SL2 acting on a vector space. Let's just take the irreducible representation of dimension D. And then 
Okay, so, yeah, will be, you won't be able to verify that this is exactly the same algebraic space, but I'll write it down. So we're gonna form the following locus inside the product of these two representations. I'm gonna take the set of linear forms and cortex such that L is non-zero, linear form is non-zero. And this is the square, F is the square of a, of a quadric with discriminant one. And then I guess I'll just list it as an exercise. This isn't, shouldn't be obvious at all that this is, that if you take the quotient of this free action by SL2, you get the same algebraic space. And again, the point of this, of writing it this way is like, this is sort of a natural thing. This is quasi affine. And SL2 is a, is a nice re reductive group. Sorry, shouldn't there be some relation between L and F? Uh, I don't think so. I could have it mistaken. Uh, you'd, yeah, it should, you would expect one to, but I don't think so. At least that's, yeah, I was sort of just following how Mumford wrote it. I could have gotten it wrong. But anyway, we're not gonna go into the details why they're equivalent. So yeah, let's not, let's not worry about it. It's like page 13 in, in Mumford's GIT book. Okay, but I want to give you even more pathological examples. Um, and I'm going to try to do the similar construction I, I, just, I just did, but with, with other group actions. So let's take now, let's take Z2 acting on the affine line, but this action is going to be, this is uh, defined over R. So it's just the conjugation action over R. Um, and, and, and then, you know, this, this Z2 action, again, has a unique point that, that is fixed by a, a non-identity element. And so what we do is we just, we just remove that unique element. And then this becomes an etal equivalence relation. And, uh, but it's sort of a, what, what you get in the end is something very weird. Uh, this thing is, is yeah, let's, let's view it as defined over R. And it looks like the affine line, here's my picture over here, looks like the affine line, every point, say here T, like just take it to be a real number. If it's non-zero, then it has residue field to be R as you expect, but the origin has residue field to be C, which is just, this is just weird. This doesn't happen with schemes. And in this example, like X is defined over spec R. And if I base change to spec C, maybe I'll just list this as an exercise. Is that this, this base change is actually a scheme. And, and what scheme is it? It's, it's the non-separated affine line over, over C. And so in this picture, what we have is this is an algebraic space, not a scheme. And here we're just taking a field extension and what we get is, is, a, is a scheme. And these maps are yeah, clearly a tau. So this is an example where you don't have effective descent for in the category of schemes. In fact, th th this map is a Z2 cover, is a Z2 torsor, where the Z2 action is sort of, is acting via conjugation um, and swaps the origin. Yeah, sort of weird. Okay, <laughs> and then I can do the same thing now. Uh, with with uh, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to go over to the right hand side in example three. I have I'm just taking the union of the two axes, and then I'm taking the Z two action that swaps them. And again, you see again the origin is fixed. Uh, but then I could just throw away that unique element, um, that minus one fixing the origin and I, and I get the tau equivalence relation. And in this case, the quotient, again, I mean, because you're identifying the two axes, 
what it looks like is just like at A1, it look, kind of looks like an A1 over your field, but at the origin, you actually have two tangent vectors. It's not smooth. I mean, it's not even a unibranch a branch singularity. Uh, so it's sort of, yeah, sort of weird. Um, and finally, uh, okay, in example four, um, okay, let, let's, let's just take the characteristic to be zero. Uh, let's view, and let's view Z, you have the additive group as a group scheme over any, we can view it as a group scheme over any field just by thinking of Z as the disjoint union of copies of spec K, and then you give it a group structure by, by, by well, by the usual way. Uh, and then we can consider this action of Z on A1 via translation. And okay, this is an example, yeah. And, and, uh, and yeah, and then you can take the, the quotient. Uh, this is an algebraic space. And this is, again, it's another example of something that's not a scheme. I mean, it's not hard, but it takes a little work if you want to prove that it's not a scheme. Uh, and it's also, it's also not, not quasi-separated. Because the diagonal, the, I mean, the diagonal locally looks like Z cross A1 mapping to say A1 cross A1. That's, that's the, yeah, the corresponding, uh, yeah group action map, and that this map is not quasi-compact, simply because Z is not. And I'm listing these examples just because it's, it's sort of useful when you develop the foundations of stacks or uh, to have in mind a, a bunch of pathological examples, uh, because, I mean, things can really go wrong with algebraic spaces and stacks. And if you want to show something, uh, you often have to impose additional conditions like quasi-separated this and and knowing what you need to impose, is thinking about these examples tells you sometimes what conditions you need to impose. What uh, would be an example of a relation that doesn't come from a group action? Well, well could you be more precise? I mean, if you look technically this, I mean, here, this, this is a relation here. It's not coming from a group action, but the quotient, oh, I see. the quotient algebraic space Nevertheless, I mean, there is an alter alternative description, mm -hmm. which, which does present it as a group quotient. I see. Yeah, I think what you're asking sort of is a sort of a deep question of when, mm -hmm. yeah, which, which stacks, or which algebraic spaces can be viewed as, as quotients. Um, okay, I have, okay, I have some other examples too. Maybe these are even more pathological. Uh, okay, so let's let's say um, so yeah part, part, like okay where we're going today the goal is to, to show representability of the diagonal and this will allow us to introduce properties like like a stack is quasi separated if the diagonal you know has a nice uh, if the diagonal is quasi compact um, then, so here's uh, yeah some some sort of weird some weird algebraic spaces and stacks. So in the first example, let's take Z, Z to be a group scheme. This is an example of a discrete and reduced group, but it's not quasi-compact. Um, and then you could take the quotient BZ. Um, this is a DM stack. And, uh, but, and it's even quasi compact. But the diagonal of X is not quasi compact. Okay. And now. Wait, could, you, could you remind us how BZ is defined as a stack? Oh, yeah, good point. Actually, I didn't define this. Um, yeah, I didn't. So I, I didn't, we didn't define this. And I don't really want to go into it. So yeah, so maybe some of the examples on this page are going to be examples of stacks that we, we, we can't prove right now. And actually, yeah, we probably won't be able to prove in this course that there are algebraic, but nevertheless they are. And so it's just, you should think of them as just uh, 
like yeah pathological examples of yeah like of, of stacks with weird with weird separation properties wait is this not just like the quotient of z acting on the terminal object like z yeah but i i think when i defined bg and then when i defined x mod g i was always working with smooth and affine group schemes so like in particular quasi compact I, could, I, I yeah I, I think without much effort we could prove that this is the only Mumford, but I'd, I'd rather not worry about it. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, or yeah, or we can take so in this example six we have basically the, the, like you could view Z as a as a normal subgroup of G A, and you could take the quotients, thinking of A one as a, a the additive group. Oh, this is a one, and in this case, what you get is a quasi-compact uh, group scheme whose diagonal is not, and so therefore yeah, you can form X equals BG. So this is quasi-compact, and also the diagonal is quasi-compact, uh, and it's, and this thing is also is also locally Noetherian, but. The diagonal of the diagonal is not quasi compact. And actually, yeah, maybe a, if you if you want to work with interested with schemes, you could you could take your favorite non quasi separated scheme um, and give it the, the structure of a group, right? If you take G my, like to the a infinity union a infinity. So this is a non-separated infinite dimensional affine space. Uh, this is something that's not, right? This is an example of a scheme that's not quasi-separated. So this diagonal is not quasi-compact. And if you form here, this BG, again, it's quasi-compact. This diagonal is quasi-compact. But the diagonal of the diagonal is not. And sort of like, yeah, it's a very similar example to above. The, the difference here that this is not locally Noetherian. And so the, yeah, this example was, it was in the Noetherian world, but you had a uh, algebraic space. Okay, I'm not done yet. I have more examples. <laughs> You're probably sick of them. <laughs> Let's take, uh, I'm going to take similar. I'll, I'll take. Let's take G to be the affine line, non-separated affine line, and I view it as a group scheme over A one, right? Where where uh, it's trivial except over the origin, where, where the fiber is just Z mod two Z. So it's a it's a relative group scheme over A one. And I could, and then I could take X to be BG. Again, this lives over A1. And note that this thing is not, this is not a separated group scheme. So we're again in the case where we don't know that this quotient is an algebraic stack, but let's ignore that for now. Uh, and what you get, so this is a DM stack. You can show it's a DM stack. Uh, and X, the diagonal of X, and the diagonal of the diagonal are all quasi-compact. Uh, but, whoops, whoops. Yeah, but, sorry for this, yeah, but the diagonal is not separated. So you, you can have the lean Mumford stacks so this gives you an example of a Deline Mumford stack with quasi-compact diagonal, but not separated diagonal. And note here, the diagonal is also is representable by schemes. And here's a fact that maybe we might try to prove at some point is that if, if, if you have a Deline Mumford stack with quasi-compact and separated diagonal, then the diagonal is actually quasi-affine, in particular representable by schemes. 
So part, yeah, uh, yeah, here, yeah, in particular representable by schemes. And we like that property because we know more things about schemes and al algebraic spaces. Uh, but, and, and I'll, I'm gonna end with even a, a more, kind of sort of a crazy example where uh, I'm gonna give you an example of a Deline Mumford stack uh, whose diagonal, with, with quasi-compact diagonal, whose diagonal is not representable by schemes and therefore whose diagonal is not separated. And this is sort of a characteristic, I'm gonna use, yeah, some characteristic P. Uh, I'm gonna work over the P addicts and I'm gonna consider two group schemes over it. On one hand, I'm gonna have mu P and then I'm also gonna have um, Z mod P, both viewed relative to spec ZP, right? These are two group schemes are isomorphic and characteristic zero. So in this case, if you base change to the, the uh, fraction field, they're isomorphic. But of course, yeah, the, 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 the fibers over, over zero, over you know, the unique prime ideal P are very different. And on the left-hand side, you have you know, just Z mod P, P distinct points. And the right-hand side, you have this non-reduced group scheme, mu P. Uh, and, and so I, what I'm going to do, what I, I'm going to define now H as where I, where I take H and I'm just going to remove, I'm going to remove all non-identity elements over zero. So now H looks like the constant group scheme Z mod P over spec ZP, but over the origin, I just have one point at the identity. Um, and then I have this, I have a map from H to mu P, right? I have this map H to mu P, all living over spec ZP. And this is sort of, it's a bijective monomorphism, um, but it's not a locally closed immersion. And it's, it, and it's, and it's an isomorphism over QP, not locally closed immersion. Uh, and what that tells you is that the quotient, if this was G, if I take the quotient G mod H, this is, this is a, a quasi-finite group algebraic space. Uh, so this is a, a group algebraic space. Hey, Jared. Yeah. Do you mean to have a P fruit of unity? Uh-oh, do I? Uh -oh. Because you want to map Z mod P to mu P in characteristic zero, then you need a P fruit of unity, right? Oh, right, yeah, yeah, okay. So like either P is two or uh, you work over Z P adjoining zeta P, I guess. Right? Yeah, good point, good point. Okay, I, I'm gonna just, yeah, let's just do P equals two then. <laughs> uh, do, I, do I run into other problems in characteristic two? Uh, Otherwise you take a, yeah, a P fruit, you're right, I guess. Yeah. And, but I, I guess, yeah. Uh, but yeah, what, uh, what I was trying to say is because H to G is not a locally closed immersion that implies that the diagonal of the quotient isn't locally closed. So this thing here is not a scheme. And let's call it, let's call Q the quotient, G mod H, and then, uh, and then, well, you know what I could do? I could just erase something. I'm just gonna erase over here. And so, yeah, so that, so we had up here, you have Q equals G mod H. Uh, and this is, a, uh, and then so you could take, okay, we haven't proved this, but again, you could take the classifying stack of Q. Uh, but again, this would be over Z mod, Z mod P. And what you get is a DM stack, and the with and and the, and the diagonal uh, is not separated and not representable by schemes. But but the diagonal is quasi compact. Anyway, just another example to keep in mind. I think I'm going to move on now. <laughs> Took longer than I thought. But yeah, maybe I'll pause for question.
Okay, let, let's go to the, the goal of today's lecture, which was uh, the properties of the diagonal. So here's, yeah, to, this is the main theorem of today. Uh, the diagonal of, al of an algebraic space is representable by schemes, and the diagonal of an algebraic stack is representable by algebraic spaces. Um, this is what we need to prove. And so I, I've, I've cheated by writing a little bit here. We're going to first do the, the first part. So X is an algebraic space. And to show, I need to show the diagonal is representable. So I let T to X cross X be any map from a scheme. And I form this product. And we need to show that QT is a scheme. Okay. And uh, I mean, but the challenging part is that, you know, we really don't know that much about algebraic spaces. I mean, from the definition, all we know is that there's an atal cover. So that's what we use. We take an atal presentation by a scheme. Uh, and because we're working, you know, we're working in the atal topology. So th th that's, this is uh, because it's uh, atal and surjective, we actually know that this map is an epimorphism of sheaves, meaning that if you, if you view them, yeah, we're viewing them just as sheaves in the big atal topology. And that, that's, uh, that's like a yeah, subjection in, in that category. Or, or, and what that tells you is that you can lift maps um, atal, atal locally. And so, so what I've done here is that, you know, I have T to X cross X. And what that tells me is that there exists T, T prime, a cover of T uh, and a lift of this map. So, so like before we have a big Cartesian or we have a big cube where uh, on one hand, you know, I could form the groupoid. So on one hand I have X to X cross X. Uh, and then I have my map T. This is exactly the same sort of picture we had before. And then this, this fiber product was the QT. This is the QT prime, just defining it. And, and uh, as before, all faces are Cartesian, except left and right. Right, and so what, what do we know here? Uh, yeah, uh, on T prime is a scheme, T is a scheme. So, uh, and QT, this is, this is really what we're interested in. We know, we know it's a sheaf and we're interested in knowing that it's a scheme, but we knew, do know that this, this is a scheme. And we also know uh, that, that this map here, R to U cross U is separated and locally quasi-finite. Uh, maybe you, you want to know wait, why, why is that true? Well, on one hand, it's separated. It's even it's even a mono. It's even a, by definition. Yeah, we even know it's by definition. We know it's a monomorphism because we we started with an equivalence relation. Um, and to show that it's locally quasi-finite, I mean that's that's true because R to U is is a tau, right? This map is a tau, so that certainly has locally quasi-finite fibers, and that implies that. The, this map does too. Okay, so that, that's good, and and that and that property is stable under base change. So this is this is also separated and locally quasi finite, and then and then let's just consider the back square. In the back square, you have this sheaf that we're trying to show as a scheme, and we're exactly in the setting of effective descent where we have an, a tau cover of T, T prime, such that the base change is not only a scheme, but separated and locally quasi-finite. And that was the most, one of the more general versions of effective descent we had. And so, so now it's descent. So effective descent for separated 
and locally quasi-finite maps uh, implies QT prime. Oh, no, sorry, QT is a scheme. Uh, uh, yeah. So if you have, if you were to assume that the diagonal that that the map R to U cross U is quasi compact, then the the descent statement is a bit easier because then then you can use Risky's main theorem Risky's main theorem to know that the map is quasi affine, and so you're using an easier version of, of descent. But yeah, this is the more this works more generally. All right, and now the proof of two works like almost exactly the same way. Actually, it's a little bit easier. Um, so can, can I just ask a possibly silly question about uh, what we were just talking about? So um, maybe my memory of descent is wrong, but does, doesn't, or I, I might be thinking of a different, or a different kind of descent, but um, for me, descent means that there exists something whose pullback is the QT prime. Whereas yeah. you're saying that, or there exists a scheme whose pullback is QT prime, but like, is it possible that, that there is a scheme and also like an outbreak space? Whose pullback is QT prime, and that they're not that that such that, that the thing that descent shows exists is not QT. Is that yeah? Right? Yeah, I think what you show is that it descends. Um, you're right that if descent descent tells you that there is exists something over T that base changes to this QT prime, but then you argue further that it has to be QT, so that you so that you show that that sheaf, you get an identification of what you descended with the sheaf you started with, and and. Uh, and then, so that, yeah, that is the scheme. That, yeah, I think that's a good question. I mean, yeah. But did that, make, did that answer make sense? You, they, I guess what I'm saying is you, you're completely right, but you need to go one step further and, sh and yeah, and show that the thing you, you descended is, is equal to the sheaf QT. Yeah. Right. Okay. And so, right now we're going to just repeat this argument. In fact, I'm going to copy the square because we'll use the same sort of diagram. Whoops. Oh, all right. So now we're showing two. We're starting with an algebraic stack. And we want to show that it, this diagonal is representable. That's our, our goal. In this case, is to show that QT is an uh, algebraic space. And, and we take you know, a smooth presentation, because well, that's what we're given by definition. And, uh, and then we, we use a similar fact. But here, you have to use the fact that smooth morphisms uh, have sections that tau locally, and so that it's so that because it's smooth, it's also an epimorphism of sheaves, and that therefore you can lift the map from T to the X cross X to a map T prime to U cross U. And then right. epimorphism of sheaves is a little bit misnomer here, or am I confused? Because it's like X is not a sheaf. Oh, uh, yes, yes, that's a good point. Yes. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I think I, I was to carry too much over from the last page. So let me just say that. Let me say the exercise is to show that a locally you can lift maps. Okay, this was our square from before. We're going to use the same thing. Guess we don't know. Yeah, these. Oh, it's not. Well, I know it is a tail. Uh, and the other difference was oh. Yeah, this is x. All right. Uh, wait. So what do we need? What do we know? Is that okay? On the right hand side now, this is an Atal map, and it's representable. Because it's a morphism of schemes, it's representable by schemes. And that implies that this map is a tail and representable by schemes. And so, so we, we so QT prime to QT is an a tail presentation. 
And this is a scheme. And so we get that as an algebraic space. So this, yeah, this case was easier because we only needed to show it was an algebraic space. Okay, now I want to talk about some uh, some consequences of, of, of this. So now, because we know that the diagonal is representable, we'll be able to conclude here that any map from a scheme to an algebraic space is representable by schemes. And likewise, any map from a scheme to an algebraic stack is representable. And the proof is just like using the uh, the right Cartesian diagram. So we need to consider, you know, you have your stack or your algebraic space here, and you need to show that any map from a scheme is representable. So you need to show that for any other scheme T, that this fiber product, we need to show that this fiber product is, is either um, a scheme or an algebraic space. But we know that we can identify this by like this magic magical commutative or Cartesian diagram where this sits again here, but you're taking the base change along the diagonal. And this we know is either representable by schemes or representable. And so th therefore uh, you could infer that this is either a scheme or algebraic space. And so really what this argument tells you is that once you know that the diagonal is representable, yeah, that any morphism from a scheme, yeah, is, is representable. Okay, and uh, what I have below here is just an exercise is to show basically the relative version of this, is that the diagonal of morphisms of algebraic spaces or stacks are representable in the right way. And, and this is if and only if. So, so if, if you know that all maps from schemes uh, are, are representable, then you know that by the same argument that the diagonal is representable, correct? Yes, yeah, right. That's true, yeah, I, yeah. The point was, right, right, that you can, you can go the other way as well. Yeah, here we were interested, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, here we were interested in showing, yeah, that any, map from a scheme to the stack is representable. But you could also use this if you knew that, which is rather like, I, I'm not sure in nature with any modular problems that you could ever just show that the fiber product of any two maps from schemes is representable, but uh, you're right. All right, and the last thing I wanted to show you, it's, I, I owe you this, is that you can take the quotient of an Italo equivalence relation. And even though I've been using this notation, like. Uh, maybe this, like, we only defined U mod R, but in the case that it was, it came from an equivalence relation, we just used this, this, uh, we, we dropped the brackets because it's actually an algebraic space. It's sort of just terminology because it's an equivalence relation. Okay, so we need to show this. And I, and I claim that it suffices to show that the diagonal show that the diagonal of the, of the, let's write X as U mod R is representable by schemes. Um, Because if I if I show this, then I can then, then I can use uh, yeah. Because this would then the reason is that this then implies that for the reason on the left hand side that u to x is representable by schemes, and then and you get a tau and surjectivity by descent. Okay. Uh, and 
Well, I'm, I'm just going to use the same Cartesian diagram, maybe, yeah, as I had. Oh, I'm just going to copy it again. And what are we trying to show here? Let's see. Uh, we need to show that we're trying to show that, that this diagonal is representable and we're using the same method. Maybe there's a way to streamline this because I'm just sort of giving the same argument multiple times. Yeah. At the diagonal here, we're trying to show this diagonal is representable by schemes. So I take a scheme T mapping into it and I need to show that QT is a, uh, is a scheme. And, but what I do know is that now these maps like before, uh, let me erase some of this. Let's see. Yeah, I, I think it's, I, I should have copied the different the other diagram. It's like before this map is separated and locally quasi finite. So you, so you, so you use effective descent again. So I guess it's what, what, what yeah, it's the same argument as before. Right, because yeah, we're trying to show QT is a scheme, but we know a tau locally, it's uh, it's a scheme, and moreover, that it's a scheme uh, separated and locally quasi-finite over T prime and infective descent, and implies QT is a scheme. Wow, okay. I have a quick question. It, it seems like what we showed is that is that this, this map is representable by schemes, but do we need to worry about the difference between it being a stack or a sheaf is, or is that sort of taken care of by the fact that it's actually locally representable by schemes? Like a priori, this is just a, a tall locally scheme and it's a stack. And yeah, well, oh, well, when, when you write, like, yeah, maybe this is what I was trying to say up here. If you write using this bracket notation, what you can show is because it's equivalence relation that that stack is equivalent to a sheaf. I see. And we're using, we're trying to show that that sheaf, yeah, is an algebraic space. Something we don't know yet, maybe this is a warning, we, what we don't know, maybe these are two things that we don't know. We don't know that like a sheaf plus being an algebraic stack implies being an algebraic space. Uh, that's sort of a nice, yeah, uh, which is sort of along the lines of your question. We also don't know, too, uh, we don't know yet that the diagonal of a quasi-separated algebraic space is quasi-affine. Or a quasi, or, or an algebraic stack with separated and, and quasi compact. Di sorry, sorry. It's also true that the diagonal of a Deleen Mumford stack with mild separation conditions, namely that the diagonal is quasi compact and separated, um, has the property that it, it's, it, it's that the diagonal is also quasi affine. And this is again a useful property because we like schemes more than algebraic spaces. I have another question. Can we go yeah. So we don't know that the sheaf and algebraic stack implies algebraic space, but but do we know that sheaf and DM stack applies algebraic space already? Yes, that we know. Yeah, yeah, right. That's the difference. What, yeah, we, if we if we if we have a sheaf plus plus an algebraic stack, we just know that there's a smooth presentation by a scheme, right? And and so it, so we we all so we'll establish this in the same way that we then we we show that an algebraic stack. Plus, if you have an algebraic stack and you know that all the stabilizers are finite and reduced, then it's also a Deleuze Mumford stack. So we, we, we need we, we need to show that you can sort of slice a smooth presentation to get in a tau presentation when the stabilizers are finite. Uh, sorry, I have a silly question. Uh, does the uh, does number one also mean that if I take uh, smooth equivalence relations, I get an, an algebraic space. Well, oh yeah, uh, here, uh, you mean, uh, yes. Yeah. We, do, we don't know that yet, but we will, we will eventually, yes. Okay. 
Right now, all we know is that if you have a smooth equivalence relation of schemes, then the quotient, then you, you have a, the, then the quotient stack is both an algebraic stack and equivalent to a sheaf. Wait, just to clarify, when you say we don't know, you mean we as a class, not we as, we as a class at this, at this point of time. Thank you. Ask me again next week. Maybe, maybe we'll know by then. <laughs> All right, and maybe I'll end. Uh, yeah, I, I had ambitious hopes to get to uh, dimension and tangent spaces today, but I think I'm just going to end with a summary of now that we know that the diagonal is, uh, is representable, we can talk about properties of the diagonal. And I, yeah, and then we'll end with this and with this discussion. Uh, so recall from last time uh, that the way you, you can define the stabilizer of a point is either sort of functorially the, as the you can define it functorially as as uh, as the automorphism as yeah as the sheaf of automorphisms. And now because we know that the diagonal is representable, uh, we have this Cartesian square. And we, we know that uh, that the stabilizer group is a is at least an algebraic space. So if you'd like, yeah, you can define you can define the stabilizer using this Cartesian diagram. Uh, and maybe as as a fact is that if G is a quasi uh, quasi, hold on. Um, let me. Oh, let me say it this way. Oh, okay. If if G is a quasi compact, um, right, am I going to get this right? Oh, do I need quasi separated? Uh, I want to say on a weak hypothesis that let's say let yeah, say if G is quasi compact. Okay, I'll add quasi separated. Then, and, and uh, okay, if G is quasi compact and quasi separated group algebraic space over a field K, let's say K is algebraically closed, then it's actually a scheme. It's actually an algebraic group over K. So in, in, in most cases, yeah, the, the stabilizer group is something familiar. It's not just some yeah, arbitrary al yeah, algebraic space. It's usually an algebra, it's usually an algebraic group. And the way you show this is that basically say if you're working over an algebraically closed field, well, you can show it's one of these facts I mentioned, I think last time, that there's an open dense locus that's a scheme. And if you if you have the structure of a group, you can just move that open locus around to cover all the entire. G so that you get that it's a, yeah you get that it's a scheme um, and maybe and it's also kind of maybe I'll just list this as an exercise if X is an algebraic stack the diagonal we at least is is is, a, is locally a finite type so if you add the quasi compactness as assumption it's finite type and then any so but by an algebraic group here, all I mean is it's it's a finite type uh, group scheme over a field. Um, often, what we'll know, well, like you could impose that the diagonal is affine, and then you get that the stabilizers are yeah are affine algebraic groups. Okay, and then. And the, the other construction that I want to define is the inertia stack. Of X is defined as the fiber product of the diagonal with itself. So it's sort of, it's sort of a relative group scheme or at least group algebraic space over X. All right, we know that this map is representable. So this is also representable. And sort of by definition, you know, you have this relative group scheme, group algebraic space. And if I, if I take a fiber over a field value point, what you get is exactly the stabilizer group. 
that sort of packages all of the stabilizers together in a big family. Uh, but it's, all, it's also like an awfully, it's like what, it's useful to keep in mind that it's not really a nice group scheme, right? It's not flat, for instance. These fibers are varying, you know, jumping in dimension and whatnot. Sorry, both of those maps in the square are the diagonal, right? Yeah, both of these maps are the diagonal. Thank you. Right, this looks like the diagonal. That was a, supposed to be square. And maybe it's an exercise to get practice with this. Take G to be a finite abelian group. And let you, let's suppose G acts on the scheme U. Then uh, the exercise is to show that the inertia stack of the quotient is just the disjoint union of sort of the fixed locuses of, of, of given elements. So XG. Whoops. UG. Where this UG is the set of all elements in U fixed by that G. And you could also define the scheme theoretically if that bothers you. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, yeah, I'll end by just saying that we can use the diagonal to define some separation properties. Uh, so the first property we'll define is that amorphism of algebraic stacks or just an algebraic stack itself is quasi separated if the diagonal is both quasi compact and quasi separated. Yeah, I know this looks like a, a recursive definition maybe, but let's, let's say uh, you can also say that yeah, a stack is quasi separated if it's diagonal and the diagonal of the diagonal are quasi compact. And we saw sort of issues already. One of the examples I gave last time was an example of a pathological algebraic stack where the diagonal was quasi compact, but its diagonal was not. And that's not something we really want to consider. And so we define an, an Ethereum stack to have these separation properties. So a, a stack is defined to be an Ethereum if it's locally Ethereum, quasi compact and separated. So, or in other words, you know, one is locally Ethereum and it, it's diagonal and it's second diagonal are quasi compact. Uh, and maybe I'll end with just like saying how you can translate properties of a group action into separation properties. Let's, let's say we have G to be a smooth, affine uh, algebraic group over a field. And let's say G acts again on a scheme U defined over a field. So the first part of the exercise is to say that, you know, like if, if you have a point of U, say defined over that field, then the stabilizer of you know, the corresponding map in the quotient is the usual stabilizer. So in other, in other words, our, our notation is sort of motivated by and consistent with uh, uh, equivariant geometry. And two is that you know, as long as U is reasonable, say quasi separated, uh, then the diagonal of U mod G is quasi affine. Essentially because we're assuming, like the important hypothesis here is we're assuming G to be affine to begin with. So as long as U is reasonable, the quotient should have, yeah. And, and, and moreover, if U is, has affine diagonal, like separated, for instance, if you were separated, then the quotient has affine diagonal. So I guess the point here is that you can read off separation properties from the group action. Um, and as an example, we, we showed already, getting back to MG, we showed that MG is, is 
a, a quotient stack of some Hilbert scheme, some locally closed piece of the Hilbert scheme. So this is definitely, you know, separated. It's quasi projective, and so we we can conclude then that MG has, at least has affine diagonal. Later, we'll show it has it has even finite diagonal. I think this is a good place to, to stop. So we'll meet on Wednesday. I'll turn off the recording and we can have a discussion. Let's see, how do I do this? Don't